So it's, it's been a long day of talks. I'm going to give your brains a little bit of relaxation and change. We're going to do a little puzzle. Um, it's going to feed into the theme. So first, just take a look at the puzzle. Think about the puzzle. And we'll get back to this puzzle. So um, my actual title slide is this. So I'm going to talk about the engineering values that make our community our community and uh, you know, how they're applying where we've done them well, where, we're, where we need to do them even harder, keep them bring harder. Um, so that previous puzzle is an example of a Sudoku. And Sudoku is a very popular game. Um, I'm guessing most people have probably heard of Sudoku and seen the rules of Sudoku. But um, the rules are simple, easy to super simple to state. I right? place the digits one through nine exactly once in every row, column, and box. Right? Very simple bunch of constraints, but it leads to a lot of complexities. And honestly, at first, I didn't really get the appeal of Sudoku because I felt like, as a programmer, my mind jumps immediately to, I could brute force that solution like with program. Why would I spend my time trying to solve that puzzle? Um, but after, after a little bit later exposure to seeing the clever ways people solve the puzzles, I got a bit hooked. Um, because what you find is there's a lot of really elegant patterns and chains of inference that people can build. And it's just kind of, you know, puzzles are fun. I think a lot of programmers like solving puzzles. Um, so the, the appeal is you don't have to brute force it. And um, you, know, you get to find clever connections. Uh, the kind of thing kind of tickles the same thing in my brain that I get when I'm solving uh, hard programming puzzles. But um, one of the things that annoys me about Sudoku is that when newspaper editors tend to say, like, hey, here's our Sudoku, they're really careful to say, tell people, don't worry, you don't need to do any math. And I, and I find that pretty ironic because, I mean, they mean you don't need to do any arithmetic. But solving Sudoku is actually the most mathy thing a lot of people get to do because a Sudoku solution is really a proof, right? You're constructing a bunch of inferences through a bunch of steps. And as long as every step is sound, you know you got to a good answer. Um, so getting back to um, the big puzzle I started with. So people who get really into Sudoku might get sucked into the world of variant Sudoku. And this is an example of that. And these puzzles can appear absolutely baffling the first time you see them. There's just nothing to grab onto. Um, but there, there is a guiding principle here. Right? These puzzles are not randomly generated. They're lovingly handcrafted. And they usually leave a trail of things for you to find. Um, so there's like a hidden method to the madness. And there's a give and take between the puzzle makers and the puzzle solving communities as they like trade techniques and get familiar with patterns and then have to one up each other. And it's, it's, it's a fun thing. So, um, so in this case, this is called a zipper line puzzle. And the rule is very simple, right? It's that, as you can read up there, um, I'm actually going to, let's see. Let's just actually to show you the quick break-in of this puzzle. Let's do it together. I think it's easier to do this live. All right, so how would you start this puzzle? So we're going to pay attention to, uh-oh, I'm not looking at the same screen as you. All right, I'm going to do the pre-made version then. I have a little screencast. I'll just have to narrate at the right speed. OK. So we notice this square right here. Right? Now, by normal Sudoku rules, we want to ask, where can it go in this box? And it can't go there, because it's going to collide in the column. And by the zipper line rules, right, we know that the squares on the zipper line add up to that central square. So it can't go on its own zipper line. So when we look at that box, we realize it can't go there, it can't go there, it can't go there. So it has to go there. All right, so we've identified two places where the same number goes. And then we do the, now we're going to move on to the next number here, the blue one. And we can use that same logic up here. We say it can't go there, it can't go on its own zipper line. It must be somewhere up here. We don't know exactly where. And that's enough now to rule it out of that whole column in the bottom box. So we know it's not there. We know it's not there. It must be somewhere here. And then how about this third colored number? Call it yellow. Now we know that yellow has to be bigger than blue, because blue plus something equals yellow. We know that uh, and our blue was already bigger than the red, because red plus something equals blue. Now we're doing the same trick. We're repeating it yet one more time. And we're going to decide that yellow has to be somewhere up there. So if yellow is on this final zipper line that we're calling green, now we know that green has to be bigger than yellow. Yellow has to be bigger than blue. Blue has to be bigger than red. And 
what is the small what is the smallest thing red can be? Um, well, red is the sum. Red is is, is a, the sum of each of these different pairs of digits in that box. All right, so we've got five digits. And what's the very smallest thing you could put in those five digits? They have to be unique because they're in one box. It'd be one plus two plus three plus four plus five. The fifth triangular number, that's 15. We got one more digit on the end to add in. So it's at least 16. And that's three pairs adding up to that same zipper number. So it's got to be at least six. And so therefore, we know this thing's at least six, but it's got three numbers higher. There's only one answer. It has to be six. Come on, screencast. Explain one more time. This is why I want to do it live. We're almost there. Come on, give me the payoff. I was too slow when I recorded it. OK, yes, yeah, so we know the red is 6. We know the blue is 7. We know the yellow is 8. And we get the 9. And so like each of those individual steps, when they're explained to you, when somebody explains them to you, they, um, each step by itself seems pretty simple, right? Like once somebody shows you, you can follow along. But knowing where to look is where all of the art in this thing, kind of thing happens, right? The art is in knowing where to look. And that really just comes from practice and learning from other people and uh, training techniques. So I think the analogy to the kind of work we do is quite strong. Uh, like well-designed software abstractions, they look really obvious once somebody shows you. Uh, but making them can seem much more mysterious, especially when you're starting out. Right? And it really just takes practice and immersion in a community of people who are solving the same kind of problems. And practice in the sense of practice makes perfect right? and exposure. I want, to make, I want to draw one last uh, analogy from the world of Sudoku, because I think it's also interesting. So even Sudoku has controversies. Um, and one is called the uniqueness controversy. Right? So the idea here is that the rules of Sudoku don't explicitly say that there's, only, uh, that there's a unique solution to the puzzle. Now, there effectively always is, because it's just bad style for the puzzle maker to give you an ambiguous puzzle. But people disagree about whether you're allowed to use that knowledge to solve the puzzle. And because of the thing about unique, so in this example, um, these little blue digits are supposed to show you the possibilities of those spaces. It's a note saying one of those three numbers fits in the box that says 137. But if you pick the three, right, that's going to force the other two corners of the square to be sevens and the last to be a three. And you'll have two sevens and two threes. And the same would go if you pick the seven. But in either case, that whole thing is so self-contained, it doesn't affect the rest of the grid. It becomes an ambiguous pattern. And so knowing, guessing that the puzzle maker made a, um, a single solution puzzle, we can actually just jump directly to the solution and say, that square's got to be a 1. That's uniqueness. Now, some people don't like uniqueness because um, it basically gives you, if you don't assume uniqueness and you still solve the puzzle, you get a stronger confidence, you get a stronger, more, stronger solution. And people like the aesthetics of that. You basically proved there was one solution. And had there not been, you could have actually caught it instead of just like using that extra knowledge. Um, so I'm drawing to your, what I'm drawing to your attention here is the idea that sometimes um, it can be beneficial to not rely on some of your knowledge. Right? Sometimes compartmentalizing away something that you know and acting as if you don't know it can let you get a stronger result than you'd get if you rely on knowing the details that you know. And that feeds directly into what we do as programmers. And it feeds directly into what I see as like part of the core engineering values of this community. So one of the hardest things in programming is knowing when to not know things. Right? Some of the most effective implementers struggle with this because I've met people who have brilliant memories and like encyclopedic knowledge of how things work. And sometimes those people actually struggle because like, other normal people can't keep up with them. We don't know how everything works. We need abstractions. And uh, like, they actually can, people who see too much of how everything works can struggle with that sometimes. It takes real practice. And um, of course, it's useful to know how things work inside. But knowing when not to rely on that knowledge is really important. And it takes a lot of practice. And you need, frequent, you need to frequently exercise the mental gymnastics of jumping over the abstraction barrier wall and back again to, to, to put yourself in the mind of someone who doesn't know how it works inside, but also jump back over to being the person who does know how it works inside so you can go fix the bug inside. All right, so the alternative to knowing how things work when you're in the other mode is knowing what they mean. right? Um, 
So haha, you thought this was a programming talk, but now that I'm between you and happy hour, we're gonna do philosophy. <laughs> All right. But stick with me, because this really is actually about why we as the Ember community are here, right? Where does meaning come from, right? To oversimplify thousands of years of philosophy, right? An eternalist is somebody who thinks meanings are fixed and clear and permanent. And a nihilist is somebody who thinks there just are no meanings and everything is meaningless. And, and they're both wrong. Uh, I, I think meaning emerges from a consensus among a community. And I think for an example of what I mean by that is just consider our, our words, right? Words do exist, they do convey meaning. Uh, and new ones get created all the time, but you can't just make up one whenever you want and expect it to do anything, right? It really is an emergent process between not just one person, it's, it's, a, it's a community effort when we construct meaning. All right, so our abstractions are like that, right? What does this code mean? We have a shared understanding of what this means. Right? In, in Ember, this would be a component invocation, right? How does it work? Some people here will know, and some people won't, and that's, that's good, actually, right? It, we have that whole continuum, and there's multiple levels to understand how it works. But even when you don't know, you can have that shared understanding of what it is. Right? So this is a very small and simple example, but the general value here pervades how we try to think about software. Right? What does that do for us? What do you get by focusing on what it is and not what it does? For one important example, right, what's a breaking change versus a bug fix? And if anybody ever argued about that, right? So, the nihilist here would say that every change is a breaking change because there's just the code, and you change the code, and it doesn't do the same thing. Uh, I love that XKDCD uh, comic about breaking changes. There's nothing you can touch that won't affect somebody, right? But when you've built a community consensus around meanings, around interfaces, around what things are and not just what they do right now, um, you can have consensus on what is a breaking change because a breaking change is the one that changes the meaning. Sometimes you want to change the meaning. But some, a bug fix is one that leaves the meanings alone, right? I meant it to be the thing that it still is, but it had a bug before. If you're looking only at the code, there's no objectively measurable way to reliably detect the difference between a breaking change and a bug fix. Right? The computer only ever sees the code. Where's the meaning? The code, the code feels solid and concrete and knowable. And the meaning can sometimes feel more squishy and nebulous and human. Uh, but meaning is very real. And it lives in standards, it lives in docs, it lives in RFCs, and it's passed from person to person. All that other stuff that's not just the code is where we do some of our most valuable work. Right? It's, it's the clarity of our meanings uh, that makes things like non-breaking changes more possible. And it's a central value of our community that we care about that work and we do our best to, we aspire to do that work really well. Right? Um, because all of our power in software comes from leverage, the ratio between that interface, that meaning, and the implementation. Right? To build ambitious applications, you need to control very sophisticated implementations with the smallest, simplest interfaces possible for the highest leverage. And that really requires a high degree of trust in your abstractions. And that's only possible when you have durable and precise and consensus-driven shared meanings. So even when you decide to phase out an abstraction that you've been relying on, that migration is gonna be far easier if everybody has a crisp understanding of what that thing is, right? If you have a, a spec for it and not just an implementation. So often the, the shortest path to removing something that is underspecified is actually to do the work to, to make the spec for it. That's how you know how to replace it, how to code mod it, how, what is the replacement strategy. So many of the successes are, that our community has been a part of are examples of when we've done this well, right? And so the Ember community was there in the middle of things helping standardize promises and classes and ES modules and decorators, which are really nearly there this time, and signals, which we got to hear about from Dan. Um, these are all examples of, these are high degree of success examples. This is where we didn't just make an abstraction for our community, but we were able to participate and make something that is now like broad enough that it permeates all JavaScript and, uh, people can actually just take it for granted, which is the highest compliment of an abstraction, is like people don't even have to think about it anymore. Uh, <laughs> yeah.
And we've also got examples that are more of the within framework abstractions. Like the durability of our templating language, even as we've evolved it and its syntax has been you know, a really strong constant. Um, our track reactivity primitive is just extremely nice building block for all of the things we've talked about in terms of reactivity. And also, I want to highlight our manager APIs, which um, have really enabled big leaps in functionality without breaking compatibility. And I, I'm going to zoom in slightly on manager APIs, because this is a low-level thing that you probably don't have to deal with, and that's a good thing. But the fact that they exist has been a really big win. And it's a pattern that um, we've used successfully and, want, and should use even more. Right, so the idea of manage, the examples of manager APIs we have is component manager, helper manager, modifier manager. This is the low-level but public and thoroughly specced out API for how, like, what does the framework consider the, what is a component, what is a helper, what is a modifier? Um, the reason it's worth designing those things is that because they're low-level APIs, you get very different design constraints. Um, because they're low-level APIs that are really only called by the internals of the framework, like day-to-day -day ergonomics of them is not nearly as important as their flexibility and stability. Right? So you can design something that's verbose but really thorough. You could design something that has room to uh, like version itself, express capabilities. You can do. Th you can focus on the flexibility. And for example, our modifier, our manager APIs are very functional programming esque, which is like ideal for flexibility and sometimes has trade-offs in terms of ergonomics, but that's perfect for these internal APIs, right? We've maximized the flexibility of them um, and don't have to worry about the ergonomics because it's not what you're typing day-to-day -day in your application, right? But it's a critical API that it exists because it's what lets us um, first experiment, right? It lets us implement new versions of core things um, in ways that are stable. You could use them in a big application and not worry that you're gonna break because it's all built on uh, stable public APIs, even if they're low-level stable public APIs. And then once the community does get consensus around the new thing that you've been experimenting with, it means that you can roll it out very incrementally. It will, it's going to get guaranteed in operability. So for example, like when we rolled out Glimmer components and redid the component model, those interoperate with Ember components. Right? You didn't have to worry about doing them all at once. Um, or for example, that you can just use plain functions as helpers in templates. That's a great feature. The helper manager API makes that possible. You don't have to worry that it's not going to compose. Like if you put two helpers together and one is the old way and one is the new way, they're going to work because they're both sharing that common low-level API. Um, so this, has been, this is a good example of uh, a pattern where sometimes you, do, you didn't have a spec for a thing. You just did the first version. It's implementation defined. But you can capture a spec after the fact codify it as a manager API, and then now that you have a spec, you can actually iterate as a community against that and do the new high-level feature. Um, so um, so those, these are examples of successes where we've, we've risen to the aspirations of, of actually building interfaces, shared meanings that are not just implementation defined. We also have cases, of course, where we don't always succeed hitting the level we want to. And we've got things that are implementation defined and don't have clear interfaces and clear specs. So some examples of those would be add-ons as historically defined, v1 add-ons as we're like calling them now that we have v2 add-ons, is an example of that. The idea here is that this, they're extremely overpowered. They can do almost anything. There was not really a clear spec for them. Uh, they have a ton of extra hooks that just got added over time, so that they're very implementation defined. To know everything an add-on can do, you really just have to read all the source of Ember CLI. Um, so that's an example of a, an area where we're uh, not hitting the goal yet. Right? I think engines is another example, and this one was interesting to me because I went back and looked at the RFC that introduced engines. It was only the 10th RFC we ever did, so we were still getting good at this process. And in the RFC, actually, it says explicitly, it would be really good to make public API defining how these things get built. But we're going to do that after we get the implementation in Ember CLI stabilized. Right? And I think, I think knowing what we know now about our process, we, would, we wouldn't do it that way this time. We would actually work together on first having the stable low-level APIs and then worrying about letting people iterate on top of them to make the high-level APIs and not the other way around. And so we've. What we've ended up with is something that's very implementation defined. And so it's slower to evolve and harder to change without breakage. Um, the, the boot process that Ember CLI uses to boot your application is another example, very implementation defined, similar to the other things I've talked about. 
Um, we already heard earlier today about things like the legacy patterns of adapters and serializers and Everdata. data. These are ones where a lot of features were added over time and they were kind of like the, what I, I would use a shorthand to say is like the, the bad example of OO inheritance, right? It's just like there's a lot of surface area. People wanted features, people added them. You're just supposed to know when to call super on which things, right? Um, our AMD loader leaking. So this is the idea that require and define are things that you can see later around an Ember application. Even though we've been, we helped write the module spec, and we've been on modules for a long, long time, we leak the fact that we don't have modules. And in a way that was never really like specced out and, and, and clear. When we could stick to the very good yes module spec. Um, and I'll kind of put under a bucket pre-octane router patterns as well. Like a bunch of things that the router does that if you were redoing it post-octane and post-tracked and all, you would do it differently, right? With different lifetimes and uh, more, interact more uh, use of tracked and all of that, right? And so these are examples of places where we haven't yet risen to the bar that we aspire to as a community, right? And so the, wow, that was supposed to be overlaid on the previous slide, it did not work. Oh, it's gonna build in again, isn't it, ha ha. This is what I get for adding to my slides in the back of the room, huh? No, keep coming. So the takeaway of this next one is going to be all the things you've heard about today are things that uh, map directly into these areas, right? So Embroider Initiative, no, I hit the button too many times. All right, Embroider Initiative is going to help us, is addressing the add-ons, right? Um, and engines, because we, are, we have several folks who are working very hard on that who care a lot about that part of the problem. We're making sure that maps into the new world and the modules first world, um, the boot process of Ember CLI, exposing it, stabilizing it, codifying it. Um, of course, we heard about warp drive and how that is you know, taking, uh, taking care of those legacy APIs on the Ember data side. Um, our AMD loader as a leaky API that is not fully specced as a stable thing, partly Embroider takes care of that, but also the upcoming strict ES modules feature, which is currently a draft RFC. That, is going to, that takes care of it even in classic builds. If you're not on Embraider yet, we're going to be offering a fully no AMD loader. Everything's ES modules. The cookie there, that, uh, the incentive, is that JavaScript top level await would been work everywhere in everybody's apps. And, um, and finally, the pre-acting router patterns. Um, the solution here, I think, is really all about doing more of what we've done successfully, like the manager pattern for So here I'm suge suggesting route manager and router manager as the implementation strategies that are gonna unlock that stuff. Uh, this, this is recent discussions that came out of this week, this conference's associated discussions with the core teams. As, we're tr as we were looking at what is, the, like, what is the quick wins that we can ship on the routing part of the story for Polaris. Um, the idea of, of route manager is just like component manager let us do iteration of what is a component, you can use route manager to iterate what is a route. And once you've stabilized that, now you can iterate on it and everything at the individual route level would interoperate. So you don't have to port them all at once. If you have a thousand routes, do one new one and try it out or do 10 new ones and leave the old ones. Router manager would be at the next higher level to swap a whole router system, which would be a later, you know, the follow on step. Um, so these are examples of you know, reasons I'm very optimistic about our community's path. Over the past year, we've seen a huge burst of investment from a lot of different Ember supporting companies and individuals. And a lot of that effort is pouring into these really high value areas where like, we're really making strategic choices to invest in the, the really high value stuff, which is you know, establishing those shared shared abstractions, uh, shared understandings, and trying to do that work right. So um, I'm really happy with all the progress we've, we're seeing. It is moving very quickly. So the takeaway is that our guiding principles, they work, and we just need to keep embering harder. Right? So uh, that's the end of the prepared slides. I know people, some people sent some questions. I'm gonna try to use some time for that. Um, so we got asked, what's the status of app v2? So the blueprint that Chris Manson uh, mentioned is effectively that. Um, if the question is, when is it RFC'd as like the official app, it's 
like going to be a question of more people have to use it first and stabilize it. Um, but that's that would be where to look and participate and try it and give feedback on it. Um, the um, so the the idea would be that app v2 is really where. Uh, similar to how we, we've already had V2 add-ons for a while, and that was intentional because add-ons are really where you, you know, if add-ons are, are holding you back, you have a lot less control than things your apps are doing. It's where ecosystem-wide concerns are really high. We really have to hold libraries and add-ons to a, more, a stricter standard than what you do with your own apps. Uh, because if your app is using some feature that turns out not to be great, like, of course, you want to avoid that, but it's a bigger problem when it's spread across 15 different packages that you don't control. Right? So we did add-ons first, uh, but we never really did V2 apps. And so this is the idea of like, committing to some changes, not gigantic changes, uh, to the app format itself. I would summarize them if you heard my EmberConf talk last year. I talked about like, categorizing the cost of change. These are O1 changes, o or cost order one changes in that even a big app is going to have a fixed cost for it. So it's about having different dependencies in your package JSON, a slightly different format for your index.html, um, and not much else. It's not that, and there's nothing you'll have to touch in every file. It's very important to us that it doesn't scale at that cost. Um, so that, that's the, the V2 stuff. Um, what are the motivations between, between, behind hinted at routing changes? So I think um, a lot of folks can probably think of things that are irksome or, um, or foot guns in the router that we have. For example, um, had we done it now, if, we, if we'd built it now, something like your, your routes class, there'd be something with the right lifetime, an object where if you used Ember's register destructor low-level APIs on it, it would actually you know, come, to, come to life when you enter a route, and then when you finally leave that route, get destructed. There's no such object with that lifetime, like routes have a global lifetime. That's not quite correct. Right? That's an example. A, a, a foot gun that people have had for a long time is model hooks don't always run. You got to know about that. Did you transition to a model or, a, or an ID? Right? So there was, we have a list of things that we know over the years we would like to change. And it's been an area slow to evolve, partly just because of prioritization and stuff. Like It's an area I want to get to, but I think embroidery is more important for me to finish right now. Um, there's a lot of other little things. Like people have a big wish list of what they want routers to be, and that's also partly why like it's easy to make a really long to-do list and then make it take a long time. But that's partly why I'm excited about again using our manager pattern to unlock that stuff to make it pot to stabilize. Here's how here's how routes hook in. Show us what you think routes should be. Uh, let us iterate on them together and then ship them so they'll, they'll all interoperate. Um, so that's examples of that. Um, I had a question about uh, LifeArt's Glimmer Next. I, I think it's a great technology demo. I think, um, I think there's definitely stuff in there that could be upstreamed and stabilized. But I, I would cite back also to the, what I was saying earlier about it's not just the code that we need. right? We have to also go through all the other steps to figure out how do you do it together as a community. Because if it, if it works for... 80% of the cases, but then, it, then the other 20% is going to tell everybody to rewrite their apps. We're not going to be excited about bifurcating the community. So I'm sure we could do the work, or, or I think it's likely you could do the work to bring some of those features across or all those features across. But the important thing isn't just that like it can run. It's that we do all the other steps as a community to make sure we really have stable shared specs and stuff like that. Um, which features in Polaris are fully ready for adoption today as they would ship in a coherent edition? I think that that is subjective and people disagree. Um, I can tell you that I am very much using template tag and glint and Ember's built-in TypeScript all together in multiple production applications. And I've seen teams doing it very successfully, um, not without some early adopter hiccups. And certainly you have to accept that like the docs and guides aren't telling you to do it yet because those are, quite, are correctly waiting for those features to be at a higher degree of polish before we say, call them recommended. Um, so if you're accepting those caveats, those are all very adoptable. Um, but definitely there's polish issues uh, to go through. I think they're rapidly, rapidly getting better, particularly template tag like in the last um, six to eight weeks like has fixed a bunch of the final things that I knew about that were pain super painful. Um, and uh, same goes for like V2 add-ons. We just closed a 
longstanding. We've been knocking down the dominoes of things that were blocking people. Ember Data, for example, going to V2, which just, just became possible like last week. We knocked the last domino and they did it right away. So it's like lots of good progress on that. Um, let's see, Yehuda hinted at server-side data loading instead of server-side rendering. Is there something being cooked up a la Fastboot to provide this? So the idea behind that, uh, I don't have a lot of detail on that, but the, the general idea would be um, it's not Fastboot because Fastboot is actually the full rendering layer. And the theory is that you get, a, you get most of the value with a lot less headache to not necessarily do full server-side rendering, but to run just the data fetching part server-side. Or, and by server side, it could also mean you know edge compute or one of those things. Um, by separating the and our our data load is already pretty good at being separated from the rendering layer. That's part of why routes are not just components; they are distinct things with distinct phases. That's a good thing to preserve and to improve. Um, so that's the general theory. It's not it's not a replacement for server side rendering. It's an alternative to it that might be a sweeter spot in terms of the benefit to cost ratio. Um, with that, I am over time, so I'm not going to do more questions. Thanks, everybody. This has been a wonderful EmberConf. I'm so excited to be here with you. Very optimistic for all the energy in this community. Thank you very much.